There have been a lot of advances in medical technology and people are living longer than ever before. But this is just making the ethical questions around euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide more complicated. At the heart of the bioethics debate is the distinction between killing and letting die. But there's also a conflict of principles. Doctors and nurses have taken an oath to preserve life, but they've also sworn to relieve suffering. So what happens when the only way to relieve suffering is to end life? Or what about the patients who freely choose death? or the terminally ill patient who's asking to cut the torment short with lethal injection. But maybe they're not able to do it themselves and they need a little bit of help. Or what about the patient who's never talked about end-of-life care but now has slipped into an unconscious state? So I was going to start with death is going to get us all, but I don't know, maybe your generation is going to be the ones that live forever. But we were supposed to have flying cars by now, so I definitely wouldn't count on it. But I also wouldn't live as if I'm not going to die. So how about this? If death does come to you, then these are things that you're going to have to think about. Still, um, I hate to break it to you, but uh, if it hasn't already happened, you're likely going to lose someone close to you. Yes, it's very sad when you lose uh, a close friend. Uh, maybe they were your neighbor. Maybe they were so close you thought they were your siblings. Um, and I'm sorry if you've had to deal with a loss this close. It's a really difficult thing to deal with. Uh, the grief and sorrow of losing a, a loved one is very complicated and difficult to deal with. Uh, but it just gets even more complicated when then you're legally responsible for deciding what to do with them. So the way I see it is that we have an ethical obligation to reflect on our own mortality and express our wishes to others so we don't put them in that situation where they're having to decide for us. Okay, so as with all ethical issues, uh, there's going to be a difference between the law and morality. Someone can consistently hold that, um, you know, some instances of physician-assisted suicide are morally permissible but that it shouldn't be legalized because they're worried about uh, it leading to abuse. Or it should be legalized uh, to respect individuals' autonomy, but they think that you know, suicide of any form is never morally permissible. So law and morality here can definitely come apart. One thing can be, you might think that it should be allowed to be legal, but that's impermissible, but you also might think that maybe it's permissible, but it should be illegal. So next we're gonna go over the Terry Schiavo case. This was a very controversial case when I was growing up, but if you haven't heard about it, here's some of the details. So in 1990, 26-year-old Terry, her heart suddenly stopped um, and she was resuscitated, but by the time she was resuscitated, she had already suffered catastrophic irreversible brain damage, which left her in a persistent vegetative state. She was wakeful, but she wasn't conscious and she didn't have any intentional behaviors, and she had almost no chance of significant improvement. Her body was sustained through IV and feeding tubes. Um, she couldn't talk and she had no advanced directive. So her husband on one hand said that she would have wanted to be taken off the feeding tube, but her parents on the other hand said that she would have wanted to stay connected. So the moral question became like, is removing the feeding tube murder or is it just an act of mercy? So the legal battle about who had the right to choose dragged on for you know decades, uh, 15 years I guess, uh, so the, the court ultimately decided with uh, Michael Schiavo uh, and the feeding tube was removed and Terry died on March 31st, uh, 2005. So some of the features of the Schiavo case are unique, uh, but in many ways it's not. Um, away from media cameras and behind uh, closed hospital doors, families are dealing with these decisions every single day. But before we get into the, the ethics debate, we need to get some terminology down and some distinctions. So first, euthanasia can be characterized as directly or indirectly bringing about the death of another person for that person's sake. This comes from the Greek words meaning good death. Um, this might seem counterintuitive, but uh, that's because death is often seen as a bad thing. But there might be some situations in which uh, death is seen as better than the alternatives. 
So some think that there's going to be a morally relevant difference here between different kinds of euthanasia. This means that they distinguish between morally permissible kinds of euthanasia and morally impermissible kinds of euthanasia. So first, there's, some people propose that there's a morally relevant difference between uh, active and passive euthanasia. So active euthanasia is performing an action that directly causes someone else to die. Whereas passive, passive euthanasia is allowing someone to die uh, by not doing something that would prolong their life. So this distinction is characterized as active euthanasia is killing, whereas passive euthanasia is letting die. Uh, the AMA, the American Medical Association, and the law um, you know, think that this distinction is uh, useful in evaluating cases of euthanasia. So the AMA is, you know, says that uh, letting a patient die is something that's morally permissible. This is also something that's legally allowed. Whereas directly killing the patient is something that's wrong. So the AMA is going to say that's wrong, but it's also something that's illegal. The AMA released a statement in 1973, the intentional termination of one human life by another, mercy killing, is contrary to that for which the medical profession stands, and is contrary to the policy of the American Medical Association. The cessation of the employment of extraordinary means to prolong life of the body when there is irrefutable evidence that biological death is imminent is the decision of the patient or the immediate family. So for many, this is going to mean that passive euthanasia is permissible while active is not. But others are going to deny that there's a morally relevant difference here. So they're going to think that in both instances, the doctor is causing the death of the patient, either by intentionally doing something or intentionally refraining from doing something. So James Rachels gives us this example of snubbing someone. So if there is an expectation that you're going to walk into the room and shake someone's hand, uh, but you walk into the room and you don't shake their hand, then you've snubbed them. You've done something, you've intentionally done something to them by not doing something. So moreover, this distinction isn't going to be as clear as people think. Instances of passive euthanasia are not really doing nothing. It's more like you're actively doing something. You're either turning off the life-sustaining machine, or maybe you're pulling out the feeding tube, or pulling out the respirator from their body. You're actively doing something. So still, the act of uh, euthanasia might be morally right or wrong, but this view doesn't really think that it's because of this passive-active divide. Another way of making a, a distinction between types of euthanasia is linked to the patient's consent. So uh, considering the patient's consent can give us three kinds of euthanasia. So first we have voluntary euthanasia. This refers to situations in which a competent patient voluntarily requests or agrees to euthanasia. Uh, communicating their wishes either uh, while competent or through instructions to be followed if they become incompetent or you know if they fall into a persistent vegetative state. So non-voluntary euthanasia is performed when a patient uh, are not competent to choose their death for themselves and have not previously disclosed their preferences. Um, and then we have involuntary euthanasia. Uh, this is bringing about the death of someone uh, against their will without asking for their consent while they're competent to decide. So everyone's going to agree that this last form of euthanasia is immoral, uh, involuntary euthanasia, um, and it's often left out of the debate. Honestly, I'm not quite sure what the difference between involuntary euthanasia is and murder. I'm guessing that you're still euthanizing them, so you're trying to do it for their sake, but um, yeah, you're still just murdering them. So now we could combine these kinds of euthanasia to make four different kinds of euthanasia. First, we could have active voluntary euthanasia. This is directly killing someone with their consent. We could also have active non-voluntary euthanasia. This is directly killing someone without their consent. We can have passive voluntary euthanasia. This is withholding life-sustaining treatment with the patient's consent. And we can have passive non-voluntary euthanasia. This is withholding life-sustaining treatment without the patient's consent. So the law and morality are going to find the active-passive distinction as more informative than the voluntary-non-voluntary -voluntary distinction. Uh, the way the law sees it is that patients have a right to refuse treatment. Thus, they also have a right to refuse life-sustaining treatment, to be withheld or withdrawn. In other words, passive euthanasia is legally allowed. Uh, but patients, if they're incompetent, uh, we should also follow their advanced directives, or we should have someone ad advocate for their interests. In the moral debate, People are not so much concerned with passive euthanasia, they're really concerned with active uh, voluntary euthanasia.
uh, whether that's morally permissible. Uh, most people in the moral debate think that it's clear that passive euthanasia should be morally permitted. So there's a related debate about physician-assisted suicide. This is sometimes abbreviated as PAS. Um, so this is the typical scenario. The patient asks for help committing suicide. The doctor prescribes a lethal dose and explains the method of suicide. Then the patient is the one that performs the final act. In contrast, active euthanasia, uh, the physician is the one that administers the lethal dose. So some think that there's going to be a moral difference here. Physician, in physician-assisted suicide, the patient is the one that bears all the responsibility. Others think that there is no moral difference here. Uh, whether the physician is helping the patient die by administering the lethal injection upon request or prescribing the lethal dose of medication upon request. Still, so the AMA officially denounces physician as a suicide, but in a 2017 Gallup poll, 73% of Americans supported the practice. Um, and moreover, the support of the practice amongst physicians seems to be rising as well. So in 2010, 46% of physicians supported the practice. In uh, 2014, it rose to 54% of physicians. And in 2016, now it's up to 57% uh, of physicians. I'm not quite sure where, if, if there are any more recent numbers than that. But yeah, so the Supreme Court ruled that uh, states have the right to legalize it as they see fit. Uh, currently, the states are Oregon, Washington, Montana, and Vermont that have legalized physician-assisted suicide. So part of the complications around euthanasia are related to the last bit of terminology, how we define death. How we define death is going to be really important. If an individual is dead, then they're no longer a person. And if they're no longer a person, then it's a right to take them off life support, or harvest their organs for transplant, or prepare the body for uh, burial. But if the individual is not dead, it, then they're still a person. And so doing any of this would constitute murder. So there are four main ways of defining death. Traditionally, death has been defined as when a person's heart stops pumping and their lungs stop breathing. Um, this is also known as the cardiopulmonary criterion of death. But with modern medical technology, we can keep someone's heart pumping and their lungs breathing, um, but they might have irreversibly lost uh, all brain function. Um, by the traditional understanding, the individual might be alive, but uh, this might strike some of us as counterintuitive. So in 1968, a committee at Harvard proposed the whole brain definition of death. Uh, according to this definition, an individual should be judged dead when all brain and brain functioning permanently cease. So this is diagnosed using an electrocardiograph. But critics point out that some physiological processes like breathing are going to be independent of brain function. So some individuals who might traditionally be considered dead may now uh, have some residual brain activity. So for instance, uh, Terry Schiavo. She was wakeful, but she lacked consciousness. Um, she was, uh, according to this definition, she would have been alive until her brain activity uh, was stopped uh, weeks after her feeding tube was removed. Some agree with this whole brain approach and that uh, Terry Shiva was uh, still alive until her brain stopped functioning. Um, but others think that the whole brain criteria is just not quite right. So they're going to propose what's known as the higher brain definition of death. An individual should be considered dead when the higher brain operations responsible for consciousness personally, permanently shut down. So the brain stem could be regulating their breathing or, and their heartbeat, um, but they might be in an irreversible coma or in a persistent vegetative state. This is also diagnosed using an electrocardiograph, but they might consider other things as well, like the likelihood of the person ever regaining cognitive function. Um, on this definition, an individual dies when they've lost higher brain functions. This means that they're no longer a person. According to this definition, Terry Schiavo died when she lost higher brain function. So that means that she died in 1990, as opposed to the whole brain definition, which says that she died in 2005. So yeah, you can see how there's a big difference here. So another way of defining death is the loss of personhood. This is going to mirror personhood in the abortion debates. This means that an individual dies when they've lost the features that are essential to personal identity, or they've lost what's essential to being a person. But it's not really clear what that means, so this definition might not be the best one. But yeah, the criterion could be complicated. Uh, it could 
it includes such complex activities as reasoning, remembering, feeling emotions, possessing a sense of the future, or interacting with others, and so on. So now we can get into a little bit of the debate. So one of the main flashpoints is uh, the connection between active voluntary euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide. Morally, they seem to stand and fall together. So now let's look at uh, an argument in support of voluntary active euthanasia from the principle of autonomy. So the principle of autonomy means that we should be respecting individuals' autonomous choices, even if this means they're um, killing themselves. They have a right to end their lives uh, as long as they're not harming anyone else. And there's no clear line as to when life becomes a burden, so we're going to have to rely on their judgments to determine when their lives are no longer worth leading. However, the right to die does not necessarily compel others to help you die, so this might still rule out things like physician-assisted suicide. Okay, so now let's look at another argument in support of physician-assisted suicide and uh, active voluntary euthanasia, but this one's from the principle of beneficence. So if we're in a position to relieve someone of their suffering without excessive cost to ourselves, then we're morally obligated to do so. Refusing to do so would be inhumane, it would be cruel, it would be rude. So uh, passive euthanasia is seen as beneficent, it's, being, it's seen as a, an, an act of mercy in certain circumstances. But it would also seem to be analogously merciful if the physician actively helped in situations where the patient wanted to end their life, but they couldn't end their life. Um, it also seems like there are certain circumstances where active euthanasia is possibly more merciful than um, passive euthanasia. So there's an instance in the textbook where a truck flips over and the person, you can see that they're barely being held alive. Um, their you know, body is smushed, but um, the blood hasn't you know, lost their, left their body yet, so they're still alive, they're still conscious, but like, there's no chance that that person's gonna survive. And it seems like, okay, maybe in that instance, it's more merciful to actively kill them than letting them die and suffer. Um, but yes, that's, that's an extreme example. We'll, we'll look at maybe a case of like that in um, uh, the patient's rights. There's a case of a person who is um, driving through a farmland one time and, and the truck just blew up. And the farmer came out and saw him and he was just in such terrible pain and he just wanted, like from that moment, he wanted to die. But the farmer didn't want to help him out. So the farmer brought him to the hospital and he was at the hospital and he said, I don't want to live anymore. And he ultimately made it through all of these like painful, painful surgeries, but um, yeah, just really terrible. And the whole time, um, he just wanted to die. It, it, he now uh, went on to become a lawyer and now advocates for patients' rights. He advocates that, um, you know, sometimes death is the merciful thing to do. <sighs> yeah, his name is Dax Howard. We'll, we'll look at him. But yeah, so a common response is that the pain and suffering can be mediated without resorting to lethal injection. Um, their pain can be managed or improved through psychiatric care. Um, so euthanasia is unnecessary and so unethical. This might be effective for treating some people, but there are always some whose pain is not going to be manageable or possibly they can't even recover from it. Um, those against active voluntary euthanasia want to respect individuals autonomy and their beneficence um, but they think that the principles might be undermined by other considerations they're going to rely on the moral difference between killing and letting die killing is morally worse than letting die killing is wrong whereas letting die is permissible active euthanasia is seen as murder whereas letting die is letting nature take its course or letting the disease kill them but James Rachel is going to argue that there is no moral difference between killing and letting die. So he gives us these two scenarios. Uh, Smith stands to inherit a large amount of money if something were to happen to his six-year-old cousin. When the cousin is taking a bath, Smith sneaks in and drowns the cousin and makes it look like an accident. So that's scenario one. Now, Jones stands to inherit a large amount of money if something were to happen to his six-year-old cousin, just like Smith. Um, and like Smith, he's ready to drown the cousin. But when he goes into the bathroom, he found the cousin already drowning. He was ready to push the cousin's face back under if it was necessary, but it wasn't necessary and the cousin drowns. So Rachel's going to ask us, what's the moral difference here? Uh, were Jones's actions morally permissible while Smith's were not morally permissible? 
So Rachel is going to contend that there's no moral difference here between Smith and Jones, and so analogously there's no moral distinction between active versus passive euthanasia. So Winston Nesbitt uh, is a bioethicist, uh, and he's going to argue that uh, the real reason Smith and Jones are equally morally reprehensible is that they're both prepared to kill. If uh, Jones were merely ready to kill but not prepared to kill his cousin, then his actions would not have been morally reprehensible as Smith's. So I'm not totally sure I understand what uh, Nesbitt's getting at here, but I, I get what he's trying to say here, that there's a difference here in their intentions, uh, that, they, that both Smith and Jones in these scenarios had the same intention to go and kill that child, or uh, to go and kill their six-year-old cousin. Um, but that there's, there's a subtle difference here, that if, if one were only merely ready as opposed to prepared to kill, um, that there might be a moral difference there. Uh, but I also look at this moral difference as like, so imagine if the courts actually had video cameras of what was going on in the bathroom, and we actually had objective viewing of this. It's like we would still say, you know, both of them are really, really bad. Um, you know, Smith might be on a scale from zero to 100, 100 being the worst, Smith might be 100. Uh, and Jones might only be a 99 or a 98, so they seem like they're really, really bad, but like, Jones isn't doing anything actually morally wrong there. There still seems to be a difference, or, or maybe, I'm, maybe I'm not totally getting what Rachel's getting at there. Others are going to argue for the permissibility of active voluntary euthanasia by making a distinction between the intending someone's death and not intending but foreseeing it. This is emphasized by the doctrine of double effect. Again, this is part of natural law theory, which is going to be coming from the Catholic Church. So it's wrong to intend to harm someone, causing their death, even if it's to produce a good result, relieving their pain. But it is permissible to do something that produces a good result, relieving their pain, even if it leads to an unintended but foreseeable harm, uh, their death. The intent is supposed to be different here. Uh, but this is going to suppose that uh, intentions have, are singular and clear but oftentimes our intentions are mixed and we have a few of them going on at once. And also if we seem to, if we can foresee that an outcome is going to happen then, and we do it anyway, it seems like we're somehow still intending that outcome even if it's um, you know, not actually explicitly intended. Um, so others are going to say that there's no clear line uh, between intended and unintended actions. So critics are going to point out that neither the physician nor the patient really intend the death uh, if the suffering or uh, you know, pain could be avoided without it. Obviously that would be what the patient and the doctor prefer. Others are going to object that, uh, to the intended unintended distinction here because even if it's wrong to uh, do harm to bring about good, Death might, be, death might not be harm to the patient. If the pain is unbearable and the condition is untreatable, then death might be considered a blessing. So one of the more convincing arguments uh, against explicitly allowing active voluntary euthanasia it comes at the policy level. So what are the ramifications if we were to legalize this practice? This argument is going to use this slippery slope uh, form. So it's gonna say that allowing active voluntary euthanasia or physician-assisted suicide is going to inevitably lead to non-voluntary euthanasia or to involuntary euthanasia. Or it might lead to families and physicians pressuring patients towards suicide. So now we have this quote from Gay Williams. Euthanasia as a policy is a slippery slope. A person apparently hopelessly ill may be allowed to take his own life. Then he may be permitted to deputize others to do it for him, should he no longer be able to act. The judgments of others then becomes the ruling factor. Already at this point, euthanasia is not personal and voluntary, for others are acting on behalf of the patient as they see fit. This may well incline them to act on behalf of other patients who have not authorized them to exercise their judgments. It's only a short step then from voluntary euthanasia, self-inflicted or authorized, to direct euthanasia administered to a patient who has not given authorization, to involuntary euthanasia conducted as part of a social policy. So these slippery slope arguments are going to rely on a key empirical premise, that permitting active voluntary euthanasia will inevitably lead to unjustified killings. But is there good evidence to support this claim? So, so far there isn't much data to go on, 
Uh, the Netherlands did not legalize the practice until 2002, and it was not legalized in Oregon until the Supreme Court approved the practice in 2006. Uh, and so far, the studies done, legalization of active voluntary euthanasia has not led to a multiplication of non-voluntary euthanasia. Uh, and physician misconduct was extremely rare. So I did a little search uh, on the internet, and so far all I could find was there in uh, the last 20 years or so, it seems like in the Netherlands and in other countries where this has been allowed or in even states where this has been allowed, there's only been a handful of doctors who've actually been brought up on these charges. Uh, there was one in the Netherlands in 2019, but I mean, yeah, even that case was kind of sketchy. Um, yeah, um, I'll probably post that on the discussion board. Um, what we need is better evidence to assess the slipperiness of this slope. Um, it doesn't mean uh, that the mere possibility of abuse is not enough to justify the banning of the practice. If the mere possibility of abuse uh, justify banning the practice, then we should also consider banning other practices like advanced directives or surrogate decision makers um, or any other form of voluntary passive euthanasia. For a slippery slope argument to work, you need to have good evidence that the bad consequence um, is going to be inevitable if we take the first consequence, but also that these consequences are going to be serious and highly likely to happen. So now we're going to talk about the classical ethical theories. And first we're going to talk about utilitarianism. As always with utilitarianism, it's going to depend on what considerations are being taken into account. In terms of euthanasia, it's going to depend on whether the utilitarian focuses on acts versus rules and how much importance they give to self-determination. So classical utilitarianism is going to define good in terms of happiness for everyone involved. So on the one hand, euthanasia would be permissible for someone who's in horrible suffering, inescapable pain, uh, because it would seem to bring them net happiness. On the other hand, uh, we also need to be considering the psychological, social, and financial impacts on the patients, families, uh, friends, and caregivers. So Peter Singer, following John Stuart Mills, uh, thinks that there's going to be more to consider than just happiness alone. So he's going to say, many people prefer to live lives with less happiness or pleasure in it, and perhaps even more pain and suffering if they can thereby fulfill other important preferences. An individual might pursue excellence in art or sport, knowing that they're unlikely to achieve it, and maybe even that they're going to experience pain along the way. So this approach is known as preference utilitarianism. Killing is bad because it prevents someone from satisfying their preferences. But killing can be a good thing when more of a person's preferences are going to be frustrated and they're going to be satisfied. So this is going to be similar to Don Marquis' argument against uh, abortion. Uh, killing is wrong because it takes away a future like ours. But certain situations of euthanasia are not going to be wrong because you're not taking away a future like ours. They're not going to have uh, much of a future. So, preference utilitarianism is one of the newer versions of utilitarianism. The traditional utilitarianism has been divided by act versus rule utilitarianism. So, act, util act utilitarianism thinks that uh, you should maximize the happiness uh, of each action. So, euthanasia is going to be permissible in cases where the benefit is going to outweigh the cost, and impermissible where the cost is going to outweigh the benefits. In contrast, rule utilitarianism Rule utilitarianism is going to say that we should follow rules that tend to promote the greatest net happiness for everyone involved. So most slippery slope arguments uh, against euthanasia are going to come from this rule utilitarian approach. The idea that uh, rules that authorize killing would lead to a society with negative consequences. So specifically they're worried about uh, an increase in non-voluntary or involuntary euthanasia or that this is going to erode the respect of the medical profession as a whole, or weaken society's abhorrence to uh, homicide. So the Catholic Church uh, in the natural law approach is going to condemn both active and passive euthanasia, but uh, this is going to come with some uh, qualifications. Uh, again, according to the doctrine of double effect, it's not permissible for the doctor to give the patient enough painkillers to put them out of their misery, but it is permissible for the doctor to ease the patient's suffering, even if the foreseeable consequence uh, is that the patient is going to die. Further, on the natural law approach, there's no obligation to use every means necessary possible to prolong an individual's life. So again, this is going to justify uh, passive euthanasia.
So finally we have deontology. According to Kant, suicide is going to be strictly prohibited because this treats the person's body as a mere thing and it's going to completely obliterate personhood. So he says, the rule of mortality does not admit of suicide under any condition because it denigrates human nature below the level of animal nature and so destroys it. Clearly a person must not be killed or permitted to die, uh, but it's not obvious what Kant would say about individuals in persistent vegetative states. Um, are we required to keep them alive at all costs? Or does non-voluntary euthanasia in these situations, like pulling the plug, actually let them die with dignity? Okay, so we've been covering a lot of things today about euthanasia. So euthanasia is going to be the direct or indirect bringing about the death of another person for that person's sake. So there's often a divide between active versus passive euthanasia, but there's also sometimes a divide between voluntary, non-voluntary, and involuntary euthanasia. And then we also have off to the side physician assisted suicide where with the help of the doctor, the patient is actually taking their own life. Um, and this is only going to be more complicated because we don't have a clear definition of death. We have the traditional definition, the cardiopulmonary, the whole brain, the higher brain, and the personhood definition. So we have arguments in favor of active voluntary euthanasia, um, you know, from the principle of autonomy and the principle of beneficence. Um, and those who are, tend to be against uh, active voluntary euthanasia say that these principles are going to be undermined uh, by other things, certain distinctions, like the distinction between killing and letting die. Some people are going to say that there's a morally relevant difference here. Others are going to say that there isn't a morally relevant difference. Um, some people are going to appeal to uh, the intentions, whether the physician is intending uh, or whether the death is just an unintended but foreseeable consequence. But again, many people are skeptical of applying this distinction here. Finally, others are going to make the slippery slope arguments. It's going to say that, hey, if we allow this practice, it's inevitably going to lead to abuse and physician misconduct. But these arguments are going to rely on uh, you know, data, but the data is sparse, and so it's not clear that we should be drawing uh, many conclusions from this yet. So what I want you guys to be reflecting on is uh, the distinction between uh, active versus passive euthanasia. Um, is, do you think there's a distinction here? Like, obviously there's going to be a difference, uh, but is there a morally relevant difference here? Um, what, like, does the consent matter? Does the patient's, uh, you know, involuntariness matter here? Um, is there a morally relevant difference between voluntary and non-voluntary? So whether the patient is, um, you know, making the decision themselves because they're alive and, and conscious, or if they're in a persistent vegetative state and they're not making it for themselves. Now, obviously, there's going to be a moral difference here with um, involuntary euthanasia. That should be morally impermissible, but the other ones uh, might be morally permissible. But then what about doctors? What kind of obligations do doctors have? Do doctors uh, have an obligation to help patients um, who are in need uh, or in pain? Um, is, do you see this as an act of mercy? Is physician as a suicide a case of mercy? Okay. So, um, yeah, I want you guys to just reflect on this, think about it. Um, I, I looked up something, so in the United States, the majority of people who believe in physician assisted suicide are gonna actually be in the state of California. So, you might only know other people around you who agree with you about physician assisted suicide, but um, the rest of the country might not. So that's something else to think about when you're thinking about this. Um, but yeah, I also hope that um, the metaphor of the sunset behind me uh, really wasn't lost on you. So, yeah. All right. I'll see you guys in class.